Hello and welcome to the second episode of the Chicago Dialogues. I'm Deepesh Chakrabarti, <laughs> professor of history and South Asian language and civilization at the University of Chicago. I'm also currently the faculty director of the University of Chicago Center in Delhi. The Chicago Dialogues are being produced by the University of Chicago Center in Delhi and Prohor Dot in uh, in a collaborative program over the next several months. We're very fortunate in having the well-known author, Mr. Abhik Chanda, as the anchor and curator for these conversations. Today's conversation is between my esteemed colleague, Professor Muzaffar Alam, a world-renowned specialist on Mughal India, and Mr. Chanda himself. Mr. Chanda is also the author of a best-selling book on Dara Shukho. His book has been described by Mr. Arun Shauri as the book we needed about the man we need. Welcome again. Enjoy the episode. Enjoy the series. Thank you very much, Dipeshda. And a very good evening to you viewers. Welcome to the second episode of Chicago Dialogues. Now we have this Shakespearean quotation, the near in blood, the nearer bloody. And as we know, history is replete with the unfulfilled promise of princes who've been cut down in their prime. And the Mughal Empire is no exception. This particular episode traces the life and times of the crown prince, Muhammad Dara Shukho. His prodigious talent as a chronicler, poet, philosopher, connoisseur of the arts. We bring into focus his deeply syncretic ideas and the bitter rivalry with his brothers which resulted in an open war of succession, leading to his tragic end. And to bring Dara Shikho to life, we have with us Professor Muzaffar Alam. While Professor Alam is no stranger to the viewers of this program, a few words about this remarkable scholar would be apposite. Dr. Alam is the George V. Bobrinskoy Professor, South Asian Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago having been trained at Jamia Millia Islamia and then Aligarh Muslim University and finally JNU. He taught for three decades at the Center for Historical Studies at JNU and held visiting positions in a number of European and American universities. A specialist in Persian, Arabic, Hindi and Urdu, Professor Alam is one of the world's leading historians of medieval and Mughal India. He also has a strong interest in philology, literature, and text studies. His major publications include The Crisis of Empire in Mughal North India and The Languages of Political Islam in India, 1200 to 1800. Amongst the book that he has jointly authored are A European Experience of the Mughal Orient with Seema Alavi and in collaboration with Sanjay Subramaniam, The Mughal State, 1526 to 1750, writing the Mughal world and Indo-Persian travels in the age of discovery, 1400 to 1800. Professor Alam, a very, very warm welcome to you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it is my privilege that you have asked me to participate in the Chicago Dialogues series. I'm thankful to my friend and colleague, Dipesh Chakravarti as well, 
even he used one word but it was very generous and for your kind and generous introduction i am just an ordinary student of history and uh, and a bit of of course language which of course you can use the expression philology plus philology which philology old philology new philology yes so i am honored uh, and uh, of course uh, it will be my pleasure to respond to whatever questions that you have okay. also. Uh, now professor alam when we were talking earlier amongst ourselves one thing that really struck me was the formative years in your education or if you call it the the ibtidai talim right which is very very unusual quite unique uh, and i think it will be great for our viewers if you could recount those early years uh yes uh, in fact uh, my early education was in maktab and madrasa muslim maktab and madrasa because my father was a molvi my grandfather was a molvi and several members in the, my family was molvis molanas and molvis so in keeping with the tradition of the family my father decided that i should go first to get islamic education deeni education religious education and uh, i of course gained a lot by having been there especially today when i feel that i am working on pre modern times and we are in fact my training in the language particularly arabic and persian in fact helps me a great deal so that way and also uh, even if uh, a bit of of course theology theology you know i include of course theology uh, scholasticism dogmatics ilm e kalam as we call and or ilm e fiqh the jurisprudence but more than that also my interest in islamic history in my own way of course i got a particular perspective from my teachers which i could not stay with in later times but i did get in fact an idea of islamic history particularly early islamic history prophets times prophets companions time and prophets companions companions time the early islamic history so these were the advantages but there were also in fact losses i felt later when i meet my friends that i am deprived of many of the things which perhaps would have helped me in my understanding of uh, even philology let alone history there have been in fact so much in fact besides of course the question of evidence and interpretations so many things in fact in history so that i miss yeah so this is what right um, and as a historian your your work as an academic you started off by focusing on political economy but thereafter this focus i wouldn't say shifted but it broadened the canvas completely broadened and it encompassed theology statecraft philology language itself so uh, tell us about that process in the evolution yeah. of your thought good question yeah yes so in fact you know uh, i was influenced as a student in aligarh university my masters and mphil uh, are from aligarh my as i you a uh, graduation ba is from jami millia so i was influenced by some of my best teachers there uh, who had worked on economic history of mall india or rather agrarian history of mall india i am referring to irfan habib's great book agrarian yes. history so i thought that i should in fact uh, write something along those lines and uh, in particular in the post aurangzeb period so that was a kind of political economy Uh, so but then i realize then i realize because the time also changed and the historiography also the focus on history changed from late 70s uh, you know uh, onward so uh, i realize that you know even if i have of course the advantage of uh, looking at the documents more closely uh, i would not say uh, correctly <laughs> you can always you know commit errors but more closely and meticulously but why should i use my knowledge of the language only to read the revenue documents and revenue records so i should read also something which have a reflection on the culture living styles and relationship human relationship religious culture etc and also uh, the the literary cultures so these two things together 
my own, in fact, you know, dissatisfaction with the use of whatever little that I had acquired, and also, in fact, the changes. And amongst, in fact, uh, as I, you know, I can, if uh, considering the time, I should not, you know, for instance, the great book, in fact, emerged during the same time, uh, you know, by Ronajit Guha, uh, in, with reference to India, you know, this yes. uh, elementary aspects of uh, peasantry uh, uprisings. Uh, but in fact, you know, in course of time, I've, I've noticed that uh, many of his close friends, including my, uh, my colleague and friend Dipesh, they would write more on, it started with, of course, a kind of economic history, uh, in, but it's, you know, moved to culture, religion, and the questions of, of course, everyday life. So, so this is one. And then, of course, I came to, uh, to in 2001, I moved to uh, Chicago. And here, of course, I met my friends and I was asked to teach the language Persian, also advanced Urdu, and, and several other philological texts, which I read. And when you read the text, and when I realized that perhaps many of the things that I have uh, derived from my earlier uh, cursory sort of reading now uh, are, you know, different. So mm -hmm. between the lines, etc. So, so the results, of course, you saw that in 90s, I published on uh, literature, Persian language and literature, and also, in fact, I know something on Sufism, and on a statecraft, as you say, the norms of governance, ethics, that is Nasirian ethics, and which, of course, I combined in my lecture, Devashkar Memorial Lecture in Kolkata in 1996, uh, where I was invited. And that, in fact, gets a better, in fact, expression uh, in my book, uh, Languages of Political Islam. Yeah, please. Uh, speaking about, uh, speaking that, about that particular book, Language of political Islam. To what extent would you say it derived from that early process, that early education? Because going back to the time of the madrasa, I remember you telling me you were not only studying the Quran, the surahs, and the hadith. There were times where you would actually challenge intellectually. You will challenge your teachers, and the interpretation that they expound right would be different from what you realize. So I'm, I'm trying to get a feel of how that would have shaped this particular book. Yeah, in fact, you know, my training in history combined with my earlier training in madrasa combined, in fact, enabled me to interrogate some of the things which, which I had read, uh, not simply from my uh, madrasa teachers, uh, the written by madrasa teachers, but also from my university professors. You know, uh, my training in history, for instance, in Aligarh, it was focused that, uh, you know, the, the Islam that you have in India was not the same Islam, uh, the Arabic Islam. Uh, and, you know, but it was not, in fact, focused much. I realized that, you know, Abak or Il Tutmish are not Islamic names. And uh, even many of the names which are considered to be Muslims today in India, they are not Islamic names. Parveen, Shaheen, Parvez, Husro. So I thought that perhaps if Islam could be quote unquote Persianized or Turkified after you know it left the you know confines of Hijaz, Makkah and Medina, why not if Islam could be also Indianized? But unfortunately, I didn't have expertise of examining the non-Persian Indic sources. Otherwise, perhaps, you know, it's a major lacuna in this book where I, in fact, ask questions, but my response, my answer is not complete, not satisfactory to my own self. So these are some of the questions uh, which, in fact, you know, agitated me and which uh, I had in mind when I started in fact, or developing, they started developing uh, the argument for, for this book. Of course, it is in continuations of my, whatever I had read and I had written in the 90s earlier. It was published, of course, through, through 2004. Uh, when I was, yes, and in when I moved here, besides, of course, my experience and learning from uh, experience with my colleagues, learning from my students, 
you know, something happened that was 9-11. And that 9-11 also, in fact, gave me a jerk, shocked me. And I thought that perhaps uh, Islamic history or the experience of, uh, you know, people in the past of Islam has to be, in fact, you know, presented with reference to India in a, in a, in a, in a different way. So that this kind of misunderstanding will be. So that is that was my. Uh, Professor Alam, we now come to the main focus, the main subject of today's discussion, which is Darab Shoko, uh, the high noon of the Mughal Empire with Pacha uh, Shah Jahan and Darab Shoko and his brothers, and how that entire drama unfolds. But before talking about Darab Shoko, I think it will be very interesting for our viewers. If you could lay out, if you could paint a picture of the imperial household, what was it like for a prince of the Mughal Empire to grow up back in the day? What was it like for Dara Shukur in his formative years? Yes. Uh, actually, what happened in uh, Shah Jahan's time, or you know, what happened to Dara Shukur, or what we, or Aurangzeb, was not something unexpected i would say if we have a you know a rough idea of uh, what is in fact what were the basics of the mughal uh, uh, mughal norms of government governance and mughal uh, statecraft you know the sovereignty in timuri tradition was uh, not exclusive for the Badshah, of course. When the Badshah, when the king is on the throne, of course, he's the exclusive king in terms of, in practical terms. But, you know, his immediate male sons, it is shared by all, all male sons. Mm -hmm. So there was no fixed, and there was no fixed law or fixed principles of primogenitor that who would succeed the reigning monarch, the reigning Basha. Thus, the expectations would be on the part of the princess that they should have all equal opportunity to grow, to be tutored, to be mm -hmm. trained. Mm -hmm. The masters or the tutors which the Basha would select should be of the same, if not, if not the same, of similar, in fact, metal, similar qualities. And the households that they would build after they are, you know, about 10 or 12, also should have the same facilities in terms of money provided by the uh, imperial coffer, the, the royal coffer. So this was, in fact, the expectations. But what happened that practically, Throughout the history, this norm was violated by almost everybody, even Babar. Mm -hmm. you know, I start from India, even Babar. You know, Babar, you know that he had particular love and affection for Humayun. Of course, so and Humayun, of course, succeeded him. And yes. then Humayun, you know, if if we have read or if you browse through Kanune Humayuni, Humayun had his own vision of power his own vision of kingship to the extent, you know, in fact, my understanding is that he was not defeated by uh, Sher Shah because he was there, you know, in the battlefield and he was, in fact, Sher Shah was much ahead of him. Of course, he could have been and he had much better training. He had also local connections in the Battle of Chausa. But much earlier in Bengal, Humayo had a darbar, a court, and it is reported that when Humayo came to the court, Everybody should, in fact, raise the slogan, Behold, the sun is out. Now, this thing, of course, would not be welcomed by his brother, Mirza Hindal or Mirza Askari, let alone Mirza Kamran. 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 So you have, in fact, after he moves out of Bengal, and of course, he is stayed in Bukumayo, he is also very fond of good weather, good food and opium. So, and he enjoyed Bengal. Uh, rainy season, so he was late also, in fact, to return and, and he suffered. I mean, I should not go into the details. And there he did not get, in fact, good support 
uh, of his brothers. Uh, you know, uh, you know the conversation that he had with Mirza Askari after his defeat when he when he arrives in Delhi. So, uh, so this is second violation. Now, come to Akbar's time. He is, in fact, the cleverest, the shrewdest, and the best, and the builder of the Mughal Empire. But you see that you know after his power gets a kind of stability, he wants to, in fact, deal with his half brother Mirza Hakim. He does not, even if he has more or less, more or less unshared ruling, unshared control over the kingdom of northern India, Indoganj, and also whatever the extension that had taken by the late 70s, 1570s. But he is not, in fact, he always considers him a threat. And one of the major things that he decides, whatever the reason, one explanation could be that Mirza Hakim is under the influence of Naqshbandi and Dara Shuko of, oh, sorry, Akbar for some reasons, having lived in India, mm -hmm. and having dealt with, in fact, Indian uh, communities, he thought that you know, the understanding that Naqshbandi had could not be, in fact, uh, implemented, uh, really, understanding of religion. In, in Indian uh, context. But you know, the fact is that he would not tolerate Mirza Hakim. And uh, uh, so, so that is one. And after he has literally demolished Mirza Hakim and he is exclusive, he has exclusive control over North Frontier, uh, Northwest Frontiers. Now, you know, when his own time comes to decide and to give opportunity to his sons and grandsons and and the princess, what he does, he ignores. In fact, he ignores the principle, and he 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 shows preferences for for Jahangir's son, Prince Khusro. For his grandson, yes. For his grandson, and and you know that the result was Jahangir's rebellion, and of course, I mean Jahangir is forgiven, and then Jahangir comes to the throne. But you know, this is significant that how it is that Jahangir managed to get support from the nobility because the nobility is aware of the Timurid tradition. They knew that this was, despite their, of course, immense regard for for Akbar, and uh, they, particularly Murtaza Khan, uh, Sheikh Farid Bukhari, you know, and even Mirza Koka, I mean, even if he was not, uh, or the Rajput Rajas. So I think that, you know, this is this is the violation, second violation, major violation. And Jahagir himself, Jahagir had suffered. But then at one stage, he in fact favored one of his sons, Prince Khurram, and called him shah e jahan the king of the world. He is still prince. And he calls him, he himself is the conqueror of the world. And his son is now shah e jahan the king of the world. This was absolutely, absolute violation. And this would have offended, you know, Prince Parvez or even Prince Shahriyar. Shahriyar by that time, Shahriyar was nothing. Yes. Or in fact, Mirza uh, or Khusro. But Khusro, he blinded Khusro. When he came to power, he did not trust Khusro. He blinded him. And you know that when Prince uh, Khurram is favored and he showed, of course, his abilities to be the real, of course, successor of Jahangir. And, uh, you know, both in the both in the, 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 the charge of Dakan, one of the conditions that he, you know, uh, he, 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 that Khusro has to go with him Khusro on his had campaign. Him. Khusro had to go with him. And then, you know, that mysteriously Khusro, Khusro uh, exactly. died. He comes back, but Khusro doesn't come back. So Shah Jahan, despite Prince Khurram, despite the fact that he's the favored son of his father, and he's Shah Jahan, but he does not, uh, you know, uh, trust uh, the blinded, the blinded, you know, uh, uh, brother, of course, you know. Uh, Professor Alam, if we come to Dara Shukho, would it be fair to say that from an early age itself, there was quite a bit of partiality? Of course, his mother, Mumtaz Mahal, died young. But it is we have evidence to show that he was definitely the beloved of his mother and certainly his father, vis-a-vis -vis many of the other children, particularly the other three brothers. Yes, uh, in fact, there is no doubt about it. One, you know, let us not forget that Dara is Dara is for for some other reasons, pure emotional human reasons. Dara is the 
beloved son of his father and mother because dara was you know before dara no males no male child would survive and he came as a barakat of as a grace of as a dua of uh, khwaja mohiduddin chishti so you know all this and he was the eldest son and he survived so that could be uh, but you know uh, his mother he is also beloved of his mother and it is not just a coincidence so it could be coincidence uh, that his mother of course unfortunately died you know um, within 3 years of uh, shah jahan's coming to power shah jahan came to power of course uh, literally in november 2000 or oh, 1627 but practically from 1628 and and mumtaz mahal died in burhanpur uh, during the very first campaigns of uh, shah jahan uh, in uh, 1631 and at the time of death in fact of course jahan arrives with because mumtaz mahal died of childbirth and but you know after the death where he was buried of course shah jahan had decided that she would not stay there and she would have a much better in fact mausoleum uh, somewhere else in the capital but you know whenever shah jahan it is reported that whenever shah jahan would go i have no in fact details of if shuja and aurangzeb were also there but whenever shah jahan would go uh, would pay homage to the grave of uh, his wife dara shukur would be with him would be there so, with him so this is of course one of the i'm not just i mentioned this for the emo- reason emotional reason. yes so dara is of course the most favorite you know if you even if you take his uh, marriage uh, wedding in fact one of the most in fact the most expensive uh, wedding in mogal india uh, yes. that 1632 and and then of course you know dara shikos uh, you know mansab if you have dara shikos mansab you know dara shiko was given uh, and dara shiko of course was allowed to stay in the royal palace with his father and with all the luxuries uh, of the palace and dara shiko uh, the mansab that he was given was 60000 60000 zat and 40000 sawar 30000 du aspa si aspa the question and compared his mansab zat mansab with shuja and aurangzeb you know shuja had 20000 aurangzeb has 20000 dara shiko had 60000 poor murad had only 15000 with dara shiko's eldest son suleiman shiko had now the second thing is this, this is in fact a very interesting and this must have in fact offended aurangzeb that dara shiko was you know of course he was given governorship i'll come to this point it's not that he did he, he did not have governorship he had the governorship of lahabad he had the governorship of uh, of gujarat but he was also allowed to rule by deputies <laughs> he would not go to of course he visited yes. lahabad but he yes. visited lahabad to meet the pandits <laughs> in order to learn sanskrit so uh, so in 3000 so, so to an extent it would be fair to say right professor alam that he ruled almost like proxy because he has the the viceroyship the governorship of so many different provinces including the punjab but hmm. he did not spend much time there yes yeah I mean, and this 60000 people 60000 zat is for a prince who has never been on a campaign until that point and unprecedented in the entire mogal history unprecedented and even in the later times you did not have 60000 zat so that is and that of course only shah jahan could have afforded because shah jahan's empire is not an ordinary empire it's one of the richest in fact the richest empire in the world regime yes, yes. Uh, time and uh, in in mogal india of course so i think that this is this is something which which we uh, there is no doubt that but we should in fact uh, also consider the advantages that uh, accrued to dara because of his living most of the time with his father and in agra or delhi or the disadvantage and also the advantage is that he had ample time to think and you know it was he was not ruined that's also in fact the great character showed the character of he was not ruined he did not become debauch mm-hmm. he did not become addict to drinking to, to opiates or or wine or anything like that yes indeed he, must have drank drunk because there are references in some of the olamas texts that he also uh, uh, drank sharab so yes. but of course he is not addict to drink 
he is and and uh, so that is of course the the advantage and he developed the love and passion for books and he built this library which will come of course later yes so these are some of the things but he did not have the experience of administration experience of administration of course from the court from the capital he did have the experience of ruling in fact virtually and i'll come to this question later if there are any question virtually he is the king he is the king because his interference in several in fact shah jahani decisions uh, became very effective he changed the decisions of the bashah and he became virtually the bashah and this also in fact you know uh, caused you know inconvenience and an offense to to yes. his brothers especially yes. who thought that he is the best and he he is the best of course he proved to be the best of course he still proved him to be the best in the sense that he succeeded yeah uh, professor alam there is this very sharp contrast that we see so on the one hand he is in the seat of power he is in the midst of this immense almost unimaginable kind of luxury and opulence and at the same time most of his predilections most of his you know, sort of mental aptitude is towards philosophical moorings he becomes a qadiri and he you know he meets miami and then he meets mullah shah uh, tell us about those associations and those meetings in particular yes in fact you know as i told you that you know he 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 had of course uh, he benefited from these luxuries Uh, in the palace, but he was not ruling. You know, Tarashko. If you read his, in fact, the books that he had written all the time, he he is very conscious of the fact that he he has something to do with the with the esoteric aspect or the this significant aspect, tasawwuf or Sufism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He remembered all the time. that he came to this world and he appreciated he mentions and his sister particularly when he uh, you know because simultaneously both brother and sister janara compiled this geographical account sisters is munisularva i'll come to that one later so tarashiko uh, uh, remembers that he is in this world and he is flourishing because of the dua because of the prayers because of the barakat because of the grace of of khoja moinuddin chishti and khoja moinuddin chishti is a sufi he is of course the founder of the uh, chishti order in india yes. so, so he 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 in fact he uses this time to read books on tasawwuf besides of course about the life of the prophet life of the companions but primarily the books of tasawwuf and he is very much fascinated by some of the earlier hagiographical accounts of or dictionaries of the sufis in particular jami you know abdur rahman jami's uh, nafhatul uns which is of course a hagiographical account he is very much impressed he is impressed also because jami is from herat and herat on jami has close connections with the timurid prince in herat you know he has connections with the timurid you know lines of uh, timurid dynasty so this also could be the reason and 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 he is a poet chami is also a poet so uh, so in fact so so therefore before he comes into contact with mia mir and that is of course through his father and that is because uh, in lahore that is because you know after the death of one of his in fact uh, children yes. he felt depressed and father thought that he should take him because around the same time there was a reputation of 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 uh, mia mir so father in fact took him to lahore for for cure for his treatment and you know that mia mir in fact took a uh, bowl full of water and breathed into it and he gave him to drink and he drank and he said that within a week he felt that he is perfectly all right and also a, a, a new world in fact a world much beyond this world also he he felt before that, him yes and and then he, of course he paid visit to miamir again and you know i would not go into the details in fact the kind of the humility and uh, that he showed to miamir and miamir of course in fact 
the affection and love that he showed. And so after that, of course, uh, he, he felt that he, he is in a, a man of a different world. Uh, but unfortunately, he could not get initiated into the order, even if he had intended, but he could not because Mia Mir died in 1635. Darashiko met him in 1634. And Darashiko then, of course, uh, came close to Mia Mir's, uh, one of the best disciples, Mullah Shah Badakhshi, and he became Murid of Mullah Shah Badakhshi in 1639. And around the same time, he had started writing, of course, on Sufism. And in the entire 40s, you know, uh, three, three, four books that he wrote on Sufism. And then he moved to the questions of uh, Indic traditions and Islamic traditions. So this is this is how I would uh, respond to, to, to your uh, question. But Darashiko, by temperament, he had uh, he, he had inclination towards Tasawwuf. And it so happened, the immediate reason could be that he felt depressed and he was introduced to Miami. And otherwise, he could have been Chishti, like his sister. And he could have been Chishti and Qadri. In fact, Chishti, uh, Jahanara claimed that he's a Chishti. Even when she died, she said that she's a Chishti. But, you know, she was, in fact, attracted to Qadri. And she said that it was initially because of his brother. So he could have been a Chishti, but he became a Qadri. And that okay. was, in fact, I would say, coincidence. But that coincidence, that is the expression, manifestation of his Tasawwuf through, mm -hmm. in fact, Qadri Silsala. Otherwise, he is, I, I would not say by birth. He seems to be, of course, by birth, because his birth is because of the grace of Moridin Chishti. <laughs> In Ajmer, yes, yeah. indeed. Uh, Professor Alam, let's now turn to the unfolding dynamics throughout the 1640s and the early 1650s between Darashiko and his brothers. Because as you said, right, in, in terms of the traditional Timurid scheme of things, any person, any prince of the royal blood would be entitled to the throne. So in this particular case, there is Darashiko, there is Murad Baksh, Shah Shuja and of course Aurangzeb. But as the years go, one gets the feeling that the main rivalry and the bitterness of the rivalry, the absolute acrimoniousness of the rivalry is mainly between Dara Shuko and Aurangzeb. They're like counterpoints in the, in the entire sort of empire. What are your thoughts on that? So just immediate response to this question, main rivalry. The reason is that Amongst the brothers, amongst the other three brothers, Aurangzeb thought that he is the best and the most suited to take care of the empire after his father. And later on also, Aurangzeb cited in one of his letters what his father Shah Jahan thought of him mm -hmm. and Dorashiko and the other two brothers. And that shows, in fact, you know, so uh, he, 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 in fact, he says that uh, he was in love, Darashiko says that I love my, of course, uh, Mahin Pura Khalafat, that's the eldest son. But unfortunately, he is very fond of making enemy the best of the, you know, supports that nobles, Aduwe Nikukaran, those who, who were really, in fact, helpful for building and sustaining and consolidating the empire, you know, they all turn, have turned enemies, not simply indifferent enemies. And uh, Shah Shuja, of course, he is in Bengal. He is very happy there. He eats well. He is he is enjoying Bengal scene, etc. But Murad Shubash, he is good for nothing because he is very fond of, he has become drunkard. And Aurangzeb could have, you know, Aurangzeb himself. So it has to be, in fact, accepted with a sort of pinch. You know, Aurangzeb, he says that he he was in fact whatever the requirement of the empire or the state is management is he was the best but unfortunately he is very fond of rakakat rakakat in urdu means the low mentality you know you know this is from you know this one meaning of rakakat means in fact the best meaning of rakakat would be that the person who looks very meticulously and closely into everything and his rakakat, you can see that his rakakat comes out even when he is the badshah, when he is the king, 
you know, Rakakat with reference to his father, Rakakat with reference to his own son, Muhammad Sultan, Rakakat with reference to his another son, Muhammad Akbar, and Rakakat with reference to his daughter, the greatest of her time, you know, Zibun Nisa. Zibun so, the Rakakat. But of course, Aurangzeb himself mentioned that father, you know, thought that he, he suffers from Rakakat. And that Rakakat, of course, means that he's very, he looks into everything. So therefore, he is the most, in fact, sensitive to whatever is happening, you know, Around. there in Agra. And he thinks that despite the fact that he is so much in love with his father, he sends every year, in fact, from Aurangabad, the mangoes, you know, mangoes from Aurangabad. And he, you know, he, uh, and he is trying to expand the empire. The father, when he was in Dakan, wherever he failed, he wants now to, in fact, subjugate and finalize, uh, you know, the deals with the Bijapur and Golconda. And he there, you know, my brother, he is, in fact, all the time, you know, he doesn't want me to be successful. And this comes out very clearly from, in fact, 27 or 28 letters that he wrote yeah. to Jahanara. He had trust, of course, in Jahanara. Each letter, each letter, in fact, is virtually, in fact, a protest and, and, and cry for whatever. And, and, and finally, in fact, Aurangzeb is so tied off that within a period of Aurangzeb was sent to the Dakan in 1636. In 1644-45, he comes back from the Dakan without being <laughs> recalled. And he, in fact, gives the impression that he doesn't want, in fact, to be away from from the court. But of course, he was not lucky to be there in the court because he was not trusted even perhaps court and court, I should not say this, by his father. So his yeah. father sent him to Gujarat. And in Gujarat, whatever he did, you know, in Gujarat, he's dealing with Shantidas, Jain, and the demolition of the temple in Gujarat, of the Jain temple. And also, in fact, much more than that, his, his hatred against the Shias, particularly the Bohra Shias. He executed the Bohra Imam, Bohra Dai, of course it's technically Dai, Udbuddin, uh, and he became very close to, uh, to uh, Pazi Abdul Wahab of Gujarat, and also I think uh, who was Sadar uh, Mullah Abdul Qawi. So, uh, so this is what he gained. So now after he returns from, from the capital, to his new appointments from Gujarat, of course, he's recalled uh, for to lead the campaign to the Northwest frontier. But then he started, he started building the alliances. Alliances, not simply amongst the ulama and uh, I would not say Sufi, the ulama and the scholars, theologians, but also amongst the nobles, which will come, of course, later. In fact, you know, he won over even uh, Jaswan Singh and, and Raja Jay Singh, Raja, and Raja Jay Singh. Ran off, ran off Meva. So this is in fact, but more than that, perhaps when we when we think of the problems between Aurangzeb, the Shuja does not represent any particular intellectual, you know, tradition of the time, or for that matter, Murad Shah, Murad Baksh, of course, Murad Baksh uh, could have become a Shia. He had his own understanding of Islam. Uh, but this is, of course, the matter of details and also not very uh, clear and undisputed. But, you know, Aurangzeb, Aurangzeb has a particular approach to, to Islam and to the state, to Mughal state. What should be the Mughal state like? What is particular, what is the particular, in fact, and the most correct and the perfect manifestation of Islam? He is a jurist. Practically, he's a jurist. And right from the beginning, you have, in fact, his problems with the notion of millenarianism, uh, with, with which, in fact, the Mughal Empire is associated. And he doesn't want this. Of course, he later on, he became a millenarian uh, from the Naqshbandi Mujaddidi point of view, that millenarian, if there is anybody who is the renovator of the culture and Islam for 1,000 years to come, it would be, it would be, of course, Sheikh Ahmad Sarandi, Mujadid al -Fsani. And he, you know, I won't go into the details, the kind of the relations that he had with the Naqshbandi Mujadidi Sarandi Center, where he also, in fact, uh, went for particular uh, training of uh, the famous Hadith Bukhari uh, with one of the Mujadidi, and where he was, in fact, 
you know, he did not attend his father's funeral, which of course hurt Jahanara so much. He Very thought much. that he would be there, but you know, his suspicion is that he was at that time in Sri. So, in fact, this approach, the two different approaches between Dara Shiku and Dara Shiku and Dara. Yeah. We, uh, we, we come to the 1650s, and earlier in the program, you had outlined the fact that breaking with Timurid tradition, Jahangir had in fact announced his favorite uh, uh, son, uh, the Crown Prince Baba Khuram, as the Shah Jahan. But Shah Jahan goes several steps further. There is almost a near coronation. There's a darbar and he, he you know, removes uh, the ornaments and the serpage from his own person yes. and adorns Dara Shikho and confers on him the title of Shahi Buland Iqbal, Shahi which is unprecedented. And correct me if I'm wrong, neither before this nor after this in the entire Mughal Sultanate, do we see something like this? Worse, yes, worse, yes, but virtually even Khusro was Wali Ahad or heir apparent. And uh, of course, Jahangir did not. But Jahangir later, uh, in fact, under the influence of uh, Nur Jahan, wanted Shahriyar, of course, and but which did not succeed because Asaf Khan was there to support, uh, in support of, uh, of uh, uh, yes. Yeah. So, sorry about it. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Shahe Buland Akbal. I don't think that Shahe Buland Akbal is something, in fact, but this must have offended, particularly Aurangzeb. There is no doubt about it. Uh, uh, and Wali Ahad, in fact, the, all the chroniclers, in fact, interpret this word Shahe Buland Akbal as Wali Ahad. That is, he has been declared. And in fact, some of the Europeans, in fact, give you the impression that when they would visit the court, they would see two thrones, in fact, you know, the son and, and father sitting you know, next to each other. Yes, so this is true. And, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, but all this also, in fact, you know, led Aurangzeb to be more diplomatically and astutely uh, building the alliances with the nobles, mm -hmm. which of course, you know, uh, manifested uh, during the time of, of the war of, uh, succession. And, and uh, Professor Alam, this is the strangest thing. At a time where there is festering tension across the empire, there is bitter rivalry, and there is no reason why Darashiku would not have felt that rivalry. In particular, there is Aurangzeb, who is building all of these alliances, including those with some of the Rajput Rajas. And there is Darashiku, who is retreating inwards into his soul. It's, it's almost as if Aurangzeb is looking at an external empire. And Rashik was looking at an internal empire because he is looking at the translation of Yoga Vashish. He is looking at Majmal Bahrain. He is looking at Sirei Akbar, which is, I mean, you can't have a bigger contrast. Yes, that is, in fact, you know, internal empire. In fact, Dara Shikos, of course, I mean, uh, it's today, of course, from hindsight, you can say that he failed. And therefore, my, my reading would not be acceptable. Dara Shiko thought that, you know, first, the internal empire had to be, in fact, corrected. What should be the in, what should be the soul of Mughal Empire? And he was more concerned about that. And I think that you know, right from, of course, his forties is his concern with Sufism and quote unquote tall claims about his own self. He would have different voices from the world beyond uh, about his own position. So he is established Sufi. A spiritual person. He believes that he is now a spiritual person. And in the 50s, early 50s, you see him first, of course, Marad al Bahrain, Majmal Bahrain, and where, of course, general reading about Islam and Hindu traditions and seeing the similarities and resemblance. And, and then, of course, translations. And his translation, uh, particularly Yoga Vashista, despite the fact that there had been earlier three almost complete full translations and and but he is not satisfied with the translation and and then finally of course sir akbar that is upanishad 51 shlokas translations now i would particularly in fact you know give uh, uh, request your attention to the translation of yoga vashishta yoga vashishta in fact it's a book on vedanta and and therefore he is a sufi he is a vajratul wujudi sufi you know unity of being 
So he sees, of course, similarities and he's fascinated and he wants to translate. But what is important that before he translates, he, he mentions a dream. And that dream is very important. What is the dream? He sees, in fact, you know, Vashist Muni, the master of the teacher of quote unquote, I'm using it for general terms, of Ramchandra, who gives, in fact, you know, these speeches in Yoga Vashista. And, and he he sees a young man, and then of course Vashist Muni introduces him to, to this young man. He says that Ram, he is your younger brother. <laughs> Give him a sweet meat. So that is something very important. It's not simply to, you know, he is now a little ahead of this old Sufism. He is now also, in fact, looking for something similar or locating something in the Indic traditions. And he is, in fact, on a par with, you know, he is talking to Vashist Muni and, mm -hmm. and, and, and then, of course, he translates. He invites the Brahmins and he, he, he gives a new translation. And the new translation begins with the major story between, uh, between Vashist Muni the fight or the competition uh, between Vashist Muni and 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 the major uh, major uh, um, uh, I I forget I mean of course who is who is a who is a Kshatriya, but he becomes of course the major you know Muni and and this uh, this story of 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 this famous uh, you know uh, cow of course so uh, for that that's not very important but he thinks that this yoga vashista is not simply a book of vedanta yoga vashista is a book on the principles of governments who should be the ruler you know aurangzeb is preparing himself to become ruler and he is in fact he has the external uh, facets of the empire and he wants to control the nobles, etc. And he goes we with somewhere else. You know, he in fact he wants in fact to build the basis of the empire, consolidate the base. What should be the Mughal Empire like? And you know, I mean, in this connect connections, I in fact I would like to uh, to to in fact uh, give you a brief in fact uh, my understanding that Yoga Vasista comprises, as we know, a conversation between Vashist Muni and God Rama. And Darashiko reads this text not simply as a book on Vedanta, but saw Rama as an ideal king through whom he visualized his own future. He has attained the highest stage in Tasawuf. So he is also a highly spiritualized person. So as Rama, after having, having this stature of God, is the ideal ruler. So it is only he who could be the ideal ruler. This is the message that he wants to communicate. But unfortunately, the people are behind. He is much ahead of the time. And he does not, in fact, take care into. Uh, so uh, you know that the Mughals, right from the beginning, were very keen to have the ideals of the kingship and norms of governance beyond the narrow confines of Sharia, you know, Nasirian ethics in Babar and then of course its best manifestation in Akbar's time. Then you have in Jahangir's interest in uh, through this Jerome Xavier to know, to understand, you know, the European in fact understanding of European norms of governance. And we have an Adab -e Sultanat in Persian which he translated from and presented to Jahangir. And then even Dawar Baksh, that is Prince Khusrow's son, uh, who is known as also as Mirza Bulaqi, uh, or Murad Bakr, uh, he, he showed interest in the ancient Sassanid uh, times. Now you have, in fact, you have, so there is, in fact, a, an urge, a curiosity to know the norms of governance in other traditions, other than you know the traditions beyond the Islamic world. But few of them went as far as Darashuku, who showed persistent interest in knowing what Indic theories of kingship were and how they could serve as a model to be followed in Mughal India. Such an effort was quite unprecedented, since even Akbar did not go so far as to see Mahabharata as a model for, for Mughal political governance. He was curious about it. He made an attempt to understand it, but he never wanted to follow it. Dara Shiko's interest in Rama's career was also because he wanted to show how a man of God, as he saw his own self, would also be an ideal ruler. 
So he is also preparing. He is also preparing. So this is what my understanding. I think it would be very interesting for our viewers if you could share uh, one or two couplets that Dara Shukur had written, because this is also the time when he comes into his own as a poet. Yes, in and fact, you know, you know, towards the end of uh, the forties, uh, he he began to be known as a poet, and he acquires this, uh, you know, poetic name Qadri because he is a Qadri, and he is very much inspired by his uh, by his master, of course, Mulla Badakhshi. In his poetry, you have the influence of Mulla Badakhshi. So yeah, I mean, in fact, uh, the first book that he writes on uh, Majmul Bahrain uh, on the on the common Common, common, in fact, features of Indian is India and Islam, or you know, Hinduism and Islam. It begins with this famous line, which is Darashikos, Kufro Islam, Dar Rahash Puya, Vahdahu, La Sharika Lahu, Guya. The unbelief, infidelity, and Islam both are, in fact, you know, running and to find out, uh, to find out the truth. And both, in fact, are singing. The song of Vahdahu La Sharika Lahu. Because he believed that in India, primarily Indian religion is the religion of Tawheed, religion of Mawahid. They are, in fact, monotheist. They are, the idol worship is just, in fact, a part of manifestations of that monotheism because everybody cannot afford to become really pure monotheists. So, both, in fact, Indian traditions, Hinduism and Islam. So, that is one. And the second, in fact, that is very interesting. And I, I think that, you know, I, I enjoy this Musalma. And this was one of the reasons that he became, uh, you know, uh, 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 execution bill by the mullahs, of course, the ulama did not approve of it. Musalma gar badani sti ke but cheese badani sti ke di dar but parastis. If the Muslims would have known what is Buddh Parasti? What is idol worship? Idolatry. Mm -hmm. I, he, idolatry. Then they would have seen the truth, the religion in idolatry. So that is, and he himself, in fact, he writes to one of the Sufis when he, when he in the beginning of Hasanatul Arafin, perhaps, uh, one of his texts, uh, which he wrote early 19, sorry, 1651 or 52, Kufr Haqiqi. He appropriated Kufr Haqiqi the real infidelity and he gave up uh, gave up islam in majazi so this is not something new in the in the indo persian tradition in fact because we see this in rumi for instance right uh, rumi rumi of course and later on even in the 18th century you know mir taqi mir says uh, dino kya pucho dino mazhab ko when I, what are you asking mir about his din and mazhab uh, Kufr kashta lagaya dair mein baitha. He in fact applied this tika <laughs> on his forehead <laughs> and he sat in the temple. Kab ka tarak Islam kiya? Long time back he gave up Islam. But of course nobody says that, you know, Mir said something kufr and therefore he should not be buried and he should be beheaded. But Dara Shukur, of course was a prince and, you know, the around prince, around the Basha, there were many, in fact, ulama, there were many people who expected something from and, and there were also the visions of Mughal Empire. So Dara Shuko, of course. So I, I would say that Dara Shuko, in one sense, of course, he was, he was drawn into his own world. And he was a real Sufi. He would not be concerned about what would be the impact. But whatever he said, in fact, uh, it, it, in fact, it is true even today. And it should have to be as, in fact, I think uh, who uh, perhaps, you know, Kalika Ranjan said that, uh, if you think of the real peace anywhere, then you have to start, you know, with Dara. And with Dara, exactly. Uh, in the interest of time, we will not dwell too much about the tragic fate of Dara Shukur because as we all know, when the War of Succession began, there were two significant battles. One, the Battle of Samugar, and then the Battle of Deorai. At both these encounters, Dara Shukur was soundly defeated, and thereafter he became a fugitive in his own empire. And then a series of betrayals followed uh, through his flight. And he was eventually uh, betrayed by Malik Jivan. He was brought to Delhi, incarcerated at the, the fort of Salimgar, and executed under Aurangzeb's orders. We'll go on to the abiding legacy of Dara Shukur. 
What does his legacy mean in today's times? I would repeat, in fact, the same as Kalika Ranjan. And as you also have indicated in your book, uh, that, you know, today, in fact, Dara Shiko is uh, as important as he was in Mughal India. Uh, you know, I won't say more important, as important as he was in Mughal India. That is a sincere effort to understand, to live together, of course, and to understand each other's living patterns, belief practices, and to have respect for each other. Even if you do not believe that it is the same with Dara, of course, said on the basis of his research. You can debate, you can dispute his research. You know, he may or may not have been correct. But at least the message is that you should try to understand and, and that, you know, the others are also in search of truth. And, and you, the main message is that you should live together peacefully. That is Sulhe Kul. You know, he gave the real meaning, in fact, expanded meaning of the word Sulhe Kul, peace be the all. So that is what his legacy or his... Uh, his uh, and how would you compare him with uh, Akbar? Because this is something that he, everybody draws I, this comparison. As I told you that he's, he's ahead of Akbar. He, he of course, he, he, he takes ahead of Akbar's tradition, but he's ahead of Akbar. Akbar, as I told you that Akbar, of course, showed interest in Indic traditions. And mm -hmm. one of the major, in fact, the major book Mahabharata was translated, and also several others. And but you know, Akbar never thought that the Indic pattern of governance could be the model for Mughal governance. Akbar thought of in terms of Greco-Hellenic tradition maximum. Babar thought in terms of Greco-Hellenic, and Jahangir also tried to understand the European, the Western, and he showed keenness in his conversation with. Uh, with Jerome Xavier, but he never, in fact, and he translated, of course, uh, under his supervision, in fact, the first major translation is uh, of, of Yoga Vashishta, uh, but Yoga Vashishta as a, as a book of Sufism, as a book of Vedanta, as a book of discovering the world inside. But here Dara Shiko is who shows you that, you know, the book is also, you know, which helps you to, to see how the world could be managed by a ruler. So in this respect, uh, perhaps, you know, I would think that, you know, there is nothing like ahead of, but naturally he is ahead of time. He is 100 years after uh, Akbar. So, and he is after so much of experience of Mughal Empire. So he, he should be ahead of time. So uh, this is how I, I, I would think. And yeah, so one thing more, which I, Want, yes, so I think uh, unless there are questions. Uh, there so are, there are actually quite a few questions. Uh, let's have Ranaji's question first. And I'll just paraphrase it for you while we are waiting for it. Um, not this one. There's another one. So which talks about uh, the Nakshbandi influence. So I think Ranaji's question is, was there a Nakshbandi influence on Aurangzeb? This is a good question. And I would be very brief. You know, in fact, I have written something and which will come out soon. It's not Nakshbandi's influence of Aurangzeb. I would say Aurangzeb's influence of Nakshbandi. He is so stubborn and he is so much, in fact, you know, uh, obstinate. And he believes that what he thought and what he uh, does, what he did, was the only representation of truth that he would not listen to anybody, but he would be close to the people whom he thought could be, he can use for the expansion of his power. So my understanding is, of course, Aurangzeb is very close, in fact, uh, very close uh, to, in fact, many of the, you know, if not many, at least the main representative of the Sirhindi Mujaddidi, Nakshbandi traditions is almost regularly at the court. And this comes out very well, in fact, in a funny way, of course, in, in the famous uh, poet, uh, famous poet of Aurangzeb's time, uh, which is, of course, Vapai Nemad Khani Ali, Danish Khan, 
Nemat Khani Ali's, uh, this Bakai Nemat Khani Ali, which gives you the account of Golconda siege, that how Aurangzeb is under the influence of Khwaja Muhammad Naqshband. Khwaja Muhammad Naqshband is there. In fact, he relates the dream of Khwaja Muhammad Naqshband, where in fact he gets the, uh, what the nobles want, that the siege should be in fact, uh, uh, the, the 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 siege of Golconda uh, they would not approve of because the Muslims are being killed on both sides. But Aurangzeb would persist on the on the advice of perhaps Khwaja Muhammad Naqshman because according to the Naqshbandi tradition, the Shias are outside the orbit of Islam. And according to Aurangzeb also, much before he came under the influence of Naqshbandi, even in uh, in 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 his letters to to Shah Jahan from the Dakan that he writes as a viceroy of the Dakan, he shows that you know how you know, Golconda ruler, in fact, uh, being a Shia, uh, has done something uh, which violates the big, basic tenets of Islam. So I would not say that you know he is he is being influenced. I would say that he is influencing and he's yeah. using, yeah. but he certainly has very close contact very close contact. There is no doubt about it. We have evidence from the hagiographical, you know, uh, literature that is from Nashbandi uh, letters, etc. And also from the political chronicles like uh, Masri Alamgiri and of course, as I told you, Nemat Khani Ali and, and several others. In fact, uh, Miratul Alam, Bakhtawar Khan's Miratul Alam. Indeed. Uh, we have another question from Onitesh. Let's put that up. Okay, um, and I'll just read it out for you, Professor Alam. So he's, he's saying that while the historical context provides us with an idea about how and why Darashiko was push, pushed to the margins of history, why do you think Darashiko has not been highlighted in Indian uh, in historical accounts? Oh, yes. There are two. In fact, you know, uh, it's a difficult question. But I think that, uh, you know, because of uh, Aurangzeb, Aurangzeb died in 1707. And Aurangzeb, of course, would never like Darashiko's name even to be mentioned. And even in the uh, poets' accounts of Darashiko's time, you know, Darashiko is represented as the persons around whom Majazibo Majanin had assembled. The mad people and those Majaz Majazub, those who had Alandas, you know, only they would be around uh, or around Darashiko. Who, whose, in fact, understanding of Islam is always open to question. So that this is this is one. And in fact, because of Aurangzeb's being very close to the Naqshbandis, or because of the Naqshbandis being having enjoyed the patronage of the emperor so much, you have in the 18th century fairly, fairly, uh, fairly powerful. Uh, I will say fairly powerful influence in Delhi society. In fact, many of the texts, in fact, come from the Delhi society. You have one or two, three Beheshti's account and also Shah Shujai. You can have the gleans of, but you know, an account and, and true, in fact, true assessment, true evaluation of Dara Shuko, uh, would be resisted throughout the 18th century. It's the period of, you know, uh, you know, Shah Walula. I mean, I'm not suggesting that Shah Walula is against or for, but you know, there is a different world in the 18th century. And, and you know, the Nashbandi, in the Nashbandi family, there were also two, three important poets. One of them was very close to Mazar Khan, Mazar Jan Jana. Mazar Jan Jana himself is a Nashbandi Mujaddidi saint. So, you know, you can imagine. So for over 100 years, after the death of Aurangzeb. It's only in the 19th century that the people, and after they had experienced what the East India Company regime is, and after they had uh, they had noticed that the Europeans, in fact, now are, in fact, emulating uh, Dara Shiko's achievement. You know, the Indian sciences, Indian knowledge is being exported to, is being appreciated to through that, like, of course, uh, you know, first, you know, introduction of Mahabharata is through the Persian translation of Mahabharata. First introduction of Upanishad is through the translation of Darashiko's Upanishad. So I think, you know, it is in this context that Darashiko comes back to. And, but that is, of course, uh, too late. And yeah, so this is what I would 
uh, response for the moment. Uh, right. I wonder if so I we have uh, another question that we yeah. can maybe we'll, we'll close with this one. Yes, please. Um, so this is around the meditative practices. It's it's a, it's a question from Shikha, and she's asking about the Qadri tradition. Because I think, if uh, correct me if I'm wrong, in the Risala i Haknuma, there is a passage where he actually talks about the meditation uh, of the Qadris. And uh, it, it sounds very, very similar to the ancient Indic or Hindu tradition of, of the Pranayam, uh, for example. Yes. So I think the question is around the techniques of meditation that Dara would have practiced or the Qadri Sufis would have practiced. Yes. Yeah, yes, that is, of course, that's not simply in Qadri Sufi, that is called Sultanul Askar. You know, uh, the influence of when Dara is writing, in fact, uh, uh, Risale Haknoma, he does not, in fact, show that he is already familiar with Indic traditions of yoga, and uh, uh, but it, it comes out. Yeah, later on, of course, it comes out very clearly that he has read, in fact, Indic, yes. uh, Indic texts so closely. Uh, but he discusses Sultanul Askar, but Sultanul Askar is not simply not peculiar to Qadri Silsila. Uh, in fact, in the 18th century, when you come to Chishti Saint Shah Kalimullah Jahanabadi, Shah Kalimullah Shah Jahanabadi, uh, and if you read his letters, you have in fact several letters where you have the direct influence of yoga, and not simply his letters, but also uh, his text, particularly Kashkul, there is one uh, text which is called Kashkul. So there are several, in fact, you know, you know, all these, in fact, are available in Urdu translation. In fact, uh, long time back, uh, one of the uh, one of the Delhi Walas, he came, of course, from Saharanpur Deoban. Uh, his name is Mustasan Farooqi. Uh, he was uh, he was uh, he looked after the grave of the tomb of Shakil Mullah Jahanabadi, and he also uh, had a particular a magazine Astane, and he, in fact, already managed. You know, he arranged several translations of these texts. If you go through these texts, in fact, much more, much more influence of yoga, and hatha yoga influence is much earlier. In fact, uh, from Bengal, uh, you know, uh, uh, that's Bahrul Bahrul Hayat or something Hazul Hayat Bahrul Hayat, much earlier. And there's no Qadri connection. Qadris came, of course, around the Mughal times. So I think that you know this interactions and dialogue between the Indic Sufi practices, Indic Vedanta practices or yoga practices, and Sufis had all been there, in fact. So, uh, but of uh, course, I mean, it, it yeah. is there in the uh, Risale Haknuma. You are right, and he particularly mentioned, and this particular method of litanics is or practice is called Sultanul Askar. That is the king of the litanics. The king of the Dithletics, yeah. Indeed. Um, there's one question in conclusion that I cannot resist asking because I was looking at the, the chat box and quite a few of the viewers have also asked this. If Aurangzeb, for some reason, to so some stratagem, had not ascended the throne, the Mughal throne, and it was Dara Shukho instead who had ascended the Mughal throne, how would things have played out? How would history have played out? Very briefly. I would have been the happiest person. But yes, I think that, you know, I, earlier I used to, in fact, you know, resist such questions. But I think that this is very relevant question. It's a relevant question. If Dara Shikwa had come to power, at least one thing would not have happened, which in fact alienated practically, uh, even if the manifestation of alienation is not in our Zeb's time. But if you come to the 18th century discussions and the Hindu texts, um, including the Marathas, you would uh, notice that is Jazia would not have been reimposed. Besides, of course, several you know religious administrative measures which Aurangzeb took immediately after the death of his father, and so long as his father was alive, he did not, in fact, go totally to the you know Fiqh side. And you know maybe that under Dara Shiko also a book like Fatawa Alam Giri could have been compiled, but that was hardly implemented. Of course, this is a kind of intellectual pursuit. But you know this imposition of Jazia, and you can imagine that Jazia, the way that Raja Jai Singh finally in the 18th century makes appeal to the Mughal Basha, Muhammad Shah, that why Jazia should be abolished finally, you know shows 
that how much it hurt even those nobles or hindu nobles who were still fighting for the moguls particularly those because for generations they had been you know the fathers the mulazims of the mughal empire and and they would put in fact the interests of the of the badshah before their own so it so was doubly hurtful for them and if there were no reimposition of jizya what would have happened then of course it's the question of ifs and buts you know i cannot tell you even after the no jizya there could have been quote and quote what in fact many muslim historians to their right pakistan historians hindu assertion hindu reassertion of power even shivaji in fact represented the hindu pad pasha hindu in the sense as we use the term hindu today so that would have happened or would not have happened partition would have taken place or would not have taken place in mughal india at least you know this humiliating humiliating tax for the non muslims who were fighting for the moguls this was juris- juristically unjustified you cannot impose jazia on the people who are fighting with you for the defense and safety of your empire your power so that would have happened this is one and 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 secondly of course people would have had freedom to think aloud to think aloud you know aurangzeb i will just uh, give you in fact take 2 minutes more aurangzeb in fact uh, because darashiko had become very friendly with mulla or with shah mohibullah ilahabadi you know he was a great chishti sabri sufi and when he became in fact and you have still today in fact a mosque uh, still it is there uh, in in the in the vis- Uh, in the vicinity of in the precincts of his khanqa uh, shah mohibullah ilahabadi uh, yeah mohibullah ilahabadi yes i think his name is mohibullah yeah so uh, that mosque dara shuku mosque and it is called dara ganj today it is called dara ganj now uh, you know the the you know he wrote a, a risala which is called tasviya in tasviya again it's a discussion of the tul wujud and the similarity between all religions and there is no truth truth is not confined to any particular something like that and this is in the light of quran because quran says that in each community god sent a prophet and the prophet he spoke the language of the community prophet did not speak arabic <laughs> prophet he spoke sanskrit in india and prophet he spoke jewish in fact in pre uh, pre warahmic or pre uh, muhammad times and prophet would have spoken also in some other languages so it is quite in keeping with the tradition so he wanted all copies of the tasviya to be burnt in public so and he wrote to one of his disciples who was in the mughal service sayyid muhammad qannuji that i have heard that you have this text so he said you know i have a text but i don't have enough fire to burn it and in the imperial cop in the imperial house in the palace there is enough fire so if you want to burn it you burn it burn it so so that is but the one thing which i would like in fact to end with is that this is very significant very important that throughout his letters in adab e alamgiri what were the letters are available in adab e alamgiri of aurangzeb or even raqaim crime nowhere aurangzeb accuses dara of having given up islam nowhere he says that he is a mulhid of course in his letter to rana of mewar he writes that dara bik become mulhid and atharali you know that atharali interprets it mulhid in the sense of political mulhid that he had given up the mogal tradition and dara shuk in fact aurangzeb there in fact you know demonstrates his support for the mogal policy of peace with all in fact that is this is very in fact very very diplomatic very clever letter so nowhere it is only after dara shuk had been captured that the discussion comes about dara shikos earlier of course ulama could have said something i haven't read of course all the text of the time but it is only after that that aurangzeb and it is only after that that aurangzeb does not want dara shikos name to be so it is a part of the mogal tradition that is nobody in fact you know the shah jahan also <laughs> did not want dawar bash or shahriyar or all in, there was bloodshed in fact his yes. own asaf khan in fact had committed this bloodshed there were no battle for engineer that on his behalf this is something to be considered why it is that aurangzeb does not complain 
about Dara Shiko's irreligious, irreligiosity or his love for infidelity or his giving up of Islam in his letters to Jahan. That's my question to all those, in fact, my friends who write so much, uh, you know, including my friends, of course, I have friends here and also in Pakistan. So why it is not so? How can you say? Where is the proof? Where is the proof in any one of his writings? In any one of his writings, Dara Shiko's writing that he gave up Islam. You know, the only thing is that Dara Shiko, of course, is busy in his own world. That's true, that he is busy in his own inner world. And that is, of course, that is his weakness or that could be his strength. I think that this could be his strength. It's a question of interpretation today from hindsight since he failed. So this proved to be this. You can say it was his weakness. If he had succeeded, we would have said that, oh, he was a great ruler of his time. And so thank you very much. Uh, Professor Alam, this has been an absolutely fascinating, engrossing conversation. I, for one, have learned a lot um, during this program, and I'm sure so have the viewers. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to do a little improvisation on, on Meza Ghalib Sher. Um, <laughs> oh, so nice. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm humble and uh, I feel humble. Of course, I'm just... Thank you so very much for, for being with us. And uh, viewers, we'll be back again on the 21st of November. Until then, stay safe. Thank you and goodbye. Bye. Bye.